I'm certain that most of you have heard about how the prophet Elijah, he was sent unto the most evil king of basically the Old Testament, pretty much, and that was Ahab, along with the most evil woman, pretty much, of the Old Testament, which was Queen Jezebel. Elijah was sent unto them, and I'm certain that you all remember how Elijah confronts the king after the three and a half years of famine are coming to a close, and he challenges him to a showdown at Mount Carmel. And this is what we read in 1 Kings 18. Now therefore send, and this is Elijah speaking unto the king, now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, now pay attention, the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So many in Israel meet up at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal, but the 400 prophets of the grove were not told about, and Ahab shows up. And as we all know, God sends fire down from heaven upon Elijah's sacrifice, and then they execute the 450 prophets of Baal. Now we know that other things transpire afterwards, and namely Jezebel puts a hit out on Elijah's head for killing her prophets, and God sends the rain. Elijah flees down to Mount Horeb in a cave, and he mourns unto God, and he says, Lord, I'm the only one left that serves you in the whole land. And the Lord says, No, I have other prophets besides you now, Elijah. It's very easy for us to feel alone. That's one of the first lessons to teach. We're not alone in this. There are others that God uses. Fast forward just a short time later, and we read about Naboth's vineyard and how the king looked upon the vineyard and he desired it, and Naboth refused to sell it to the king. Jezebel then conspires to have a phony trial against Naboth, put Naboth to death, then just give the vineyard to Ahab, her husband. And it's at that point that God sends Elijah back down to Ahab, and he tells him, prophesy doom upon him and his house. Tell him it's done now. It's then that we read about the king repenting and God showing a tremendous amount of mercy unto him. And he says, okay, this calamity will not befall you, but it will befall your descendants, your house afterwards. Now that's the final confrontation between Elijah and Ahab, but it's then that we read a little bit later on about another prophet named Micaiah. Now in between the time of Elijah and Micaiah, let's figure out what's going on and why is Micaiah brought onto the scene. In 1 Kings 20, we learn about a battle in which Israel's king Ahab defeated Syria's king Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad promised to return certain cities to Israel, but Ramoth Gilead was never returned, and so Ahab decided to retake the city by force. And as you can see for scope, here's the capital of Ahab's kingdom in the northern part of Israel. Right up there is Mount Carmel, and right up here is Ramoth Gilead. One final note before we begin reading. It appears that 1 Kings 22, where Micaiah shows up at the very end of 1 Kings, it appears that 1 Kings 22 is detailing the final chance account for the northern kingdom of Israel to do right. Yet Ahab fails. And this after God showed him such mercy following Naboth's death. And just for a reminder, what we know of today as Israel was broken up into two kingdoms, King Ahab ruling over the northern kingdom of Israel right up here at the top with Samaria the capital right there. And then Jerusalem down here is where King Jehoshaphat ruled from the southern kingdom of Judah. So we have King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat, both kings of what we now know of as all of Israel. And right over here, once again, is Ramoth Gilead. First Kings 22, verse 2. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, normally the two kings would not see eye to eye. So why is Jehoshaphat suddenly an ally with this very evil king Ahab? Jehoshaphat was a good king because Jehoram, Jehoshaphat's son, had married Ahab's daughter Athaliah. And after this event, the king of Judah paid his visit to Samaria. So the marriage has happened. Now Jehoshaphat is allied with Ahab. Verse 3, And the king of Israel, Ahab, said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? And we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. 
And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And it's believed by the commentators that where Elijah he first said, bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the grove. And only the 450 of Baal showed up. It's believed that right here, these 400 prophets of the grove are present. And they're a bunch of yes men telling Ahab what he wants to hear. Go up. The victory's yours. It's, it's a good day. You'll make all kinds of money and stuff like that. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Perhaps... Now, we're not told this in the Bible, but it's a theory of mine. Perhaps Jehoshaphat had heard that these were prophets of the grove because no true prophets were known in the king's court. Jezebel hated the prophets of the Lord. And the prophets of the grove, knowing that Jehoshaphat was from Judah, were falsely speaking in the name of the Lord. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joshua said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah the son of Imlah. They have him locked up in a prison. Now it's while the officer is going to get Micaiah out of prison that we read about this. And Zedekiah the son of Canana made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And it's believed by commentators that the two horns represented, because the prophets would usually use such uh, physical illustrations to prove a point like this, and they believe that he was talking about the king of Israel and the king of Judah on both horns. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it unto the hand of the king. He's being sarcastic. And right here we see a second showdown that we're not told about much behind the pulpits of today. But remember how Elijah, Mount Carmel, he stood up before 450 false prophets and was sarcastic to them. Remember how Elijah tells them, Well, you're going to have to call out a little louder. Maybe Bell's asleep. Maybe he's on an, an adventure. Maybe he's, you know, and he's mocking them. Well, right here we see Micaiah doing basically the same thing. Go up and prosper. It's all good. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Apparently these two had had back and forth confrontations over and over again. And Micaiah replied, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? To which Micaiah replied, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. He's getting ready to tell him about the second vision that he had. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left, speaking of all the angels gathered together before God. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Canana, remember the one with the two horns? But Zedekiah, the son of Canana, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek 
and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? What he's meaning is, so you're speaking in the name of the Lord, but I'm speaking in the name of the Lord, so which way did the Spirit come out of me and enter into you to tell the truth? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And what the scholars believe that Micaiah's meaning right here is that whenever all of you prophets, you false prophets, go into hiding whenever the king is dead, and knowing that you all are then declared false prophets before all the people, you'll all go into hiding, and then you'll know that I'm telling the truth. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you, everyone pay attention to what I'm saying. If the king returns, then I'm false, but if he doesn't, they're false. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. How peculiar! It's almost as if he kind of believes Micaiah's. And the scripture is very plain about Ahab's character. He's a very weak man. And we see right here his cowardice. And we also see his character, how horrible of an ally that he is. He even tells Jehoshaphat to you dress up like the king. So he's basically taking the target off of him and placing it upon his ally. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. He just pointed his arrow up into the sky and smote the king of Israel, Ahab, between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at evening. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his own country. So right here we see the vision coming to pass. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor, according unto the word of the Lord which he spake. So there we see two prophets vindicated, one at the beginning of Ahab's reign, which was Elijah, and the second at the very end, which was this Micaiah. Both vindicated, both foretold the death, and the final warning, though, did not come from the great Elijah, but from this little-known prophet Micaiah. One last shot, but right here's some lessons to learn. Seek God's will first. Notice how Jehoshaphat, he waits until he's in the den of wolves with the horrible idolatrous nation and the worst king of Israel, King Ahab and Jezebel probably near them. Jehoshaphat waited until he sought the will of God. He should have sought him first. Notice what kind of trouble that he got into in the midst of the battle. He almost lost his life over the matter. So first of all, seek God's will. Number two, don't be persuaded by evil people. One thing I've always noticed about truly evil folks is that they're always plotting. They're always scheming. Whenever I was in jail many years ago, that's all the men talked about. After I get out of here, I'm going to go and do this and that. And they're always plotting something. Never follow them into destruction. Number three, never waver when you're right, like the prophets. They never did waver. They never did agree with the false prophets. No, stand your ground. Number four, know this, false preachers, or as we call them, false prophets, believe their messages. Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, these all believe what they're preaching. And just like rat poison, they'll give you 99%, a lot of good stuff, but there'll always be that poison on in there. God wants you to prosper. Notice how they keep telling Ahab about prospering and prospering, and notice this prosperity gospel and how false it truly is, even to this very day. The tactics of Satan have never changed. Number five, God will actively plan against them. Notice how God sends one spirit unto them. It only takes one spirit to influence hundreds of people. Which brings us to number six. Notice how God does not force Ahab to go to battle. 
He sends him lying preachers, lying prophets, but it's Ahab's ultimate choice in the very end, just as it is with all evil men. God doesn't send people to hell against their will. They choose that ultimately, whether they know it or not. Number seven, God does use others to convince him. So God will use others in the surrounding of these evil folks or even around you. If you're backsliding against him, God will use others even against you. Number eight, fake friends can put you in danger. Notice how he tells Jehoshaphat, you wear the kingly robes and I'll, you know, and I'm certain that he was all buddy, buddy up until that time. Whenever push comes to shove, you'll see the cowardice come out of truly evil people. Number nine, no one can hide from God. Ahab tried to dress up like a normal soldier. He tried his best to get away and deceive and plot against what God already had known about him. And uh, there's no hiding from God. In the end, the very will of God will be done. And for the final lesson, notice how Micaiah stood alone. He was in the minority with the truth. And that's usually how it is in this world where Satan is the God of it. They choose to worship him to go their own way instead of to follow God. But notice how the true men of God, the true women of God are in the minority and how so many were against him. It's the very same today. Who's on television? False prophets. You very rarely will see a true man of God on television preaching to millions. It's usually false prophets, false preachers. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 Know this, how God is always in full control, and for this cause, because they decided to reject God in their hearts, they initially started it, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. That's why he does all this, because they believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness.